Customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you're a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Customer Service Revolution Podcast with John DeJulius. This week's episode is from a webinar by John on how to become the best professional decision of your employee's life. As leaders, we need to do better. Employees deserve better. The great resignation, quiet quitting, and cancel culture, they're not indictments on employees, but rather on business leaders' lack of focus on truly caring for the people who are under their command. Today, employees are more selective than ever regarding who they'll work for. They're insisting that companies and their leaders help them live the right life. That's how you build a world-class culture. Great brands are born to help people live extraordinary lives. Great leaders inspire employees to build lives of meaning and purpose. As a result, they help their employees and customers reach their fullest potential. In this episode, you'll learn how the great resignation started a decade before the pandemic, how to create a recruitment experience, how to create an onboarding experience, how to build a moat around your top talent, and all about the power of purpose. Let's listen in as John explains more. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Employee Experience Revolution, a topic I'm very excited about. Obviously, it's become very popular in the past three years. It's the title of my new book that'll be coming out sometime in 2024. But it's about turning the the great resignation into the great retention. And we all painfully as leaders know about the great resignation and what that's done. You know, there's a lot of reasons for it. The great resignation, actually people think it started during the pandemic, but it actually started at the end of uh, 2010 and it was slowly increasing the great resignation and it obviously blew up to its height in, during the pandemic, right? So other things that, that you know, uh, employee unrewarded, employee loyalty unrewarded. This, this uh, statistic shows that employees who left their employer and started, in, you know, with a new company, 60% of them got a pay increase where employees that stayed with their same employer during that same period, only 47%. So that shouldn't be the case. The great resignation and quiet quitting are not necessarily an indictment on employees, rather uh, an employer's lack of building a world-class culture. And listen, millennials and Zs gave organizations a wake-up call that they've seen the effects on what their parents and grandparents have withstood. And they don't want any part of it. And, you know, who are we or who am I to judge that? So it was a real professional awakening. If you've ever read a book or, or saw an interview or saw a speaker who had overcome a near-death occurrence, right, survived a plane crash, you know, it, what they do after that, you know, they come back, they divorce their significant other, they quit that job, they run that marathon. And that was kind of what the pandemic did for so many people. The pandemic altered my life in a way where it made me remember that, like, it's my life at the end of the day and I get to make the decisions about it. I knew that my job at a restaurant and those days were they were over, that I wanted to go to a place that had well-being in mind. I finally had time to like sit with myself and reflect on my life. Having that moment of reflection just reminded me of my goals and what I want for myself and my family. I feel like the bar has really gone down for what people are willing to tolerate after having all this time to reflect. One of the major changes that I like and it needs to stay the same is remote working. People get to enjoy life more, but still get to enjoy the city more and they're not burnt out. 
Even if it's as simple as you get more personal days. Employees are people too, with families and responsibilities and things that they do outside of work. I think the thing that we really need for jobs to understand is humanity. Like, we want to do our jobs, but we just need some flexibility. That's all we need. So quiet quitting became a term, which, you know, there's always been what quiet quitting stands for. It's just kind of got relabeled. But again, a lot of employees don't want any part of that hustle culture, the disproportionate pay. It's just gotten out of hand in the past 40 years. You know what C-level executives make and what, you know, the, the, the average employee makes in companies, uh, lack of boundaries, dead end jobs. Employees need to be more selective and insist that employers help them living the right life. So we want to talk about that. As leaders, we need to do better. Employees deserve better. The biggest mistakes companies have made, and in, in, in my companies as well, the past uh, several years, is filling positions with just anyone because of the turnover and and just as bad just as bad is keeping poor performers right uh, you know so maybe we need 5 to 10 new employees cuz of turnover and or growth so we can't fire a couple that need to go because you know now we'd need 10 or 12 instead of 10 so you can't hire your way out of a poor culture the brands that will survive the great resignation era will be the ones who remain relentless in their hiring standards. Uh, one of the most, my favorite quotes, but most difficult to, to live by is, it's better to lose the sale than the reputation, right? It's better to turn a potential customer away because you don't, you, know, you can't accommodate them because you don't have the staff, right? Demand is too high for the staff you have. Um, I'd rather do that than give you just anyone, hire just anyone and give you a poor experience. And now you're never going to come back. You're never going to do business with it again. You're doing brand terrorism on Yelp and social media and, and all those things. Um, very hard for leaders to uh, live by, but it's very true. One of my favorite quotes ever that I've probably said, you know, too many times to my employees, that new employee orientation at, uh, to my three sons is you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I love that quote, believe in it. But I had a leadership epiphany uh, a few years ago with, with keeping and hiring bad employees, right? So, so normally I think, at least I do, if someone is, is spending time with a bad group, OK, that, you know, drinks too much, parties too much, doesn't work hard, doesn't take care of the health, whatever that is. I always, you know, blame that person. Right. If it was my son, one of my sons or, or one of my employees saying, you know, you are choosing to hang out with these people. You are responsible for the you're, you're five. Well, here was my leadership epiphany. Our employees don't get to choose their average. They're five. So if we are allowing toxic employees to work in our environments, in our cultures, and you have a rock star employee or rock star employees, one or two things are going to happen. The better thing for them is they're going to get the hell out of there because rock star employees hate working with mediocre employees. The worst thing for them is that that rock star employee stays because they trust you. They they're giving you the benefit of doubt, and then they gravitate to the average of five. And then as leaders, we're blaming them. What happened to Lindsay? Lindsay was su such a good employee. Now she's not. You know, Lindsay, Lindsay. Lindsay. No, that's uh, you know, I literally lost sleep when I kind of had that leadership epiphany of how much responsibility I am for the average of our employees and who they work with. Finish this quote. Employees do not quit companies, they quit. And everyone always says leaders. And that is true, but you got to change it a little bit. They quit people. So it just goes back to if, it, it, you know, if your employees are working with miserable people, people that aren't motivated, people that don't love and have passion for their job, you know, people quit people. So that's really important. So I think we got to stop trying to find great employees, instead focus on becoming the type of employees, a type of business that great employees seek out. Your customers will never be happier than your employees. And the customer experience is powered by the employee experience. Uh, one of the biggest questions that came up 
throughout the pandemic and, and after that is where did all the employees go? Well, I found them. OK, and and, and you'll be surprised. There is a, 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 a discretionary group of employees and by their own doesn't you know have an impact. But when you add them all together, it has a significant impact on our labor force. So the first one is people around retirement age who didn't want to retire or don't want to completely retire. Well, when the pandemic hit, they said, screw it. It's not worth it uh, dealing with all the things you had to deal with. So more and more people retired than normal. Then the opposite spectrum is people entering the workforce. During the, the pandemic, a lot of college graduates chose not to enter the workforce and stay on mom and dad's payroll and take another you know MBA or graduate course or, or whatever that may be. So that stalled a significant people of coming into the workforce. And then you have stay at home parents, people who, who, who stay at home and take care of their kids who don't have to work but enjoy working. They don't have to work financially, but enjoy working. And the pandemic eliminated a significant percentage of them because, you know, they had to be home. They had to be uh, kindergarten, third grade teachers, uh, daycare was no longer an option. And then you had the gig economy where people started going off on their own. So by each of them, it's not that significant. But when you put them all together, we lost a significant portion of labor force. But here's the positive news. This is a great place to go back and recruit. 10,000 people a day in the U.S. are turning 65. And they don't want to retire. And they have experience and they have the people skills. So, you know, really explore and widen your net of people that you, you, you are going after. So that's what's wrong. All right. That's what's been wrong. Let's talk about what's right and how to fix it. And I'm going to share some best practices with you. And so, as I told you, I'm writing that book, Employee Experience Revolution. I'm not done. So if you have some great best practices that maybe you, your company are doing, send them to me and you could be uh, potentially in, in my new book. So building a culture employees love. Let me share with you what the employee experience revolution is. Great brands are born to help people live extraordinary lives. Great leaders inspire their employees to build lives of meaning and purpose. As a result, they help their employees and customers reach their fullest potential. That is really what I think businesses and leaders are, are, are put on the earth to do. So Everything needs to be a recruitment, I mean, an experience. So if you think about it, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you or I or a you know, potential employee heard of a job opening, some company was hiring, you know, they, they, they'd go and apply and maybe hope, you know, they got the job. And that was probably the only place they were interviewing at the time. Well, today, everyone knows that it's an employee market. And, you know, someone who's interviewing with you is not only interviewing with you, they're interviewing with, you know, maybe a half a dozen other companies in or outside of your industry. So that's why we want to create an experience at every stage. So if they interview with you today and then they go and interview with someone else, the other interview, the other recruitment experience from the website to, you know, the interview process to everything that they come in contact with your brand pales in comparison. So I think number one, we got to stop acting desperate. Even though sometimes we are and we really need the bodies, you know, don't look at it as we need bodies. My philosophy is that we are not for everyone to work here, nor do we want to be. So I've always thought of our hiring and, and, and our culture to be like a 30 foot high fence with barbed wire on it. We don't want to let just anyone in. And, and so here's what we're competing with. I drop off and pick up my kids from school, so I can't work early or late. And I need to make enough to make it worthwhile. I can only work two days a week, and it can't interfere with my other job. I can do full time, just not daytime. And I need benefits, good ones. And you know, it'd be nice if you paid for my tuition, like all of it. That is an Amazon hiring commercial, right? That's what we're competing with. So if you spend most of your time coaching an employee up, trying to get them to get it, you're not hiring well. Would you hire this employee? Amy, it says you are trained in technology. That's very good. Are you adept at Excel? No. 
PowerPoint? No. Publisher? Not really. Exactly in what area of technology mm -hmm. are you proficient? <laughs> Snapchat, Pinterest, Instagram, Vine, Twitter, you know, the big ones. So would you hire that? Hopefully we're all saying no, unless, you know, maybe you're looking for a social media marketing person, but we've all hired that person in the past uh, three years or most of us. So building a culture moat, a moat around your rock star employees, 63% of employees who are recognized regularly said they wouldn't even consider looking for a new job. You know, what, what's a recruitment experience look like? The best companies with the best cultures that recruit the best make it overwhelmingly obvious what they stand for. So, you know, when you go to their website, when you go to your own website, look and see if it, it says what everyone else is saying, right? Uh, great place to work, job opportunities, advancement, you know, career, you know, all this uh, benefits, blah, blah, blah. A good recruiting website or, or branding either turns you on or turns you off. They don't try to be all things to all people. You know, think about the time that's wasted if 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 your recruiting is 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 generic and you're hoping to cast a wide net, but then they come in and you find out that it's totally not right fit. Let them do it on the front end, right? And so Atlassium is a, a very strong company and they use their core values. If you go to their website, they use their core values as uh, their uh, kind of filter for if you want to work here. So I'm going to show you a, a, a short clip of their video, but you'll know right away if it's for you or, or not. And, and that's, what the, you know, that, that's what you want to achieve here. Open company, no bullshit. The funny thing about it last year is that everybody is really passionate about what they're doing. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody wants what's better for the user. It's not just about doing the work that you do. It's also about like hanging out with the people here. And there's a, yeah, it's like being part of a big family. Don't the customer. So initially, I think when people come from more traditional corporate style environments, they're just kind of like a little shocked initially. Don't the customer when I think that. It forces me to step out of my engineering mindset, thinking about the intimate details of the problem, and to think if I was a person in front of a computer using this, how would it affect me? So again, I think it's pretty obvious, you know, you, you start getting the feeling for if that is, is for you, if you want to explore more, if it turns you on or turns you off. Other best at multiple interviews, even though you need them today, it's, it's so often um, I hear about People are just filling out job applications and they're saying, you know, they say, stop, you don't have to, you know, it, it, you can start tomorrow. Make it hard to get an interview, uh, multiple interviews to make sure they're not just looking for the best deal, you know, that they can get. Have multiple team members involved. Team members need to be, and they don't have to be leaders, but they need to be ambassadors of your culture and protect who they're going to be around. One of the best practices is a shadow day. Have someone come in and, and don't tell them how long they have to spend, but have them come in and, and, and work along someone who, who a position that they may be doing and just get a feel for the job and walk out of there saying, you know, I, I really like this. I like the energy. I like, you know, the people or I don't like it. And that's really their chance to interview your company and see if it's a right fit. Because the biggest thing that, that we all want to avoid is in three months, finding out it's a wrong fit. And both the, the employee and the company has to start over looking for a new fit. So show career path opportunities. Tell the stories of someone who started in this position, you know, 20 years ago that today is, is a VP or managing partner or whatever that may be. And obviously make sure that you're checking uh, what investment they made in the company. What, what, why do they want to work here? Um, what do they know about your company? A lot of you may have, have heard of Savannah Bananas, right? They are just blowing up and they're a client of the DeJulius Group's. And one of the things that Savannah Bananas does that I love is in the interview process, they make their candidates submit a video cover letter, okay? And now you get a feel for the energy, how much work they put into it. They share it and say, is this someone you want to work with? So I'm going to show you one of their video cover letters. Hi, my name is Ashley Nelson, and I am applying for the director of events position with Savannah Bananas. 
after reading this job description, I know that I would be a great fit because I'm organized, detail-oriented, and big picture driven. I have extensive experience in public relations as well as marketing and events. I can successfully handle multiple tasks simultaneously and I'm comfortable leading others. Let's go! So, if you paid attention, she went and filmed the video at their stadium. And she had Take Me Out to the Ballpark playing behind. Love it. Love it. Uh, we want to make your interview process ungameable. Anyone can, you know, fool you for 30 minutes. So I like uh, interview process that employees, potential employees don't know what you're actually judging them on. So so, so a great best practice is a first round of interview is where you, instead of interviewing six employees individually for uh you know hour each six hours you interview all of them collectively and that's you know really where you're sharing hey this is what the job is this is you know blah, blah. but then you ask them questions and, and and the questions are totally irrelevant it just gets them talking but you know tell me about a time when you you know whatever that may look like and each of them have to answer the question. And typical candidates think that what they're being judged on is who has the best answer. So sometimes they may be just trying to one up the other person. But what you really should be judging them on is what they're doing when they're not talking. Right. Are they are they are they checked out? Are they peeking at their their Apple watch? Are they trying to think of a better answer than that they've heard so far? Or are they smiling at the person talking because she just said something funny and, and, and making them feel good? That's what we're looking for. Some other things, undercover interview is having different people in your interview process that the candidate doesn't know. And this is where you get to find out if, if they're kissing up the people they think that are, you know, uh, the, the decision makers versus kicking down where they show a lack of respect for the people they don't think have any role. So, you know, I've heard stories where, you know, the shuttle bus driver, the person picking them up at the airport was really part of the interview and just saw how they got treated. Um, um, that the receptionist will say of the five people that came in, who was the friendliest, most respectful, courteous, or who, you know, didn't even make eye contact. And then, you know, I, I, I've heard stories where they've had when there's a bunch of candidates sitting in the lobby, a, a delivery driver comes in with all these boxes and he just spills them all in the lobby and see if anyone gets up and, and picks up and helps them or they just keep on, you know, being on their iPhone. One of my favorite stories about this is Walter Bettinger. He is the CEO of Charles Schwab. And when it's a C-level hire and he's involved, he will have the candidate meet him at his favorite diner. And then the it, it, the diner knows that anything the candidate orders, they screw up. It's called the wrong order test. Okay, so if you order eggs Benedict, you're getting French toast, right? If you order uh, uh, ketchup, you're getting Tabasco sauce. And it's just to see how people react when you know things aren't all smooth sailing, and how they treat the waitress, how they you know conduct themselves in kind of that under those circumstances. Pret a Manger, a, a fast growing restaurant. I like what they do. Um, existing employees get to vote on who gets hired. So, you know, a candidate may come in and shadow. And why will existing employees really care? Because quarterly bonuses are awarded on performance of the entire team. Okay. So a bad hire will cost employees money. So they're not letting just anyone on their team. All right, so those are some examples of a recruitment experience. Now, the next step is the onboarding experience, which is really, really key. And, and you got the orientation and the, and, and the training. I, have, I love these two next ideas. One is called reorientation. So hopefully when you have a new employee starting, you, you, you get them together and, and you have an orientation about company history and values and policy and all that. So what we've learned from great companies that we've been doing you know, probably close to 15, 20 years is if we have six new employees going through orientation, we will have the you know six to eight existing employees reorientating. Okay, and so we'll double the size, and and existing employees have to reorientate every other year. Okay, so the benefits of this there's so many. 
you know, it revitalizes existing employees. You know, hopefully your orientation class is better than it was two years ago. It reminds them of the story of where your company came from, why it was started, the the wrong it was it was writing, what it took to get here, and where it's going. The existing employees take over the class. Um, they start telling stories. They start telling the new employees, "Oh, you're so lucky. When we start, when I started six years ago, oh, you you know, we didn't have any of this, right? We had to walk barefoot to work and in the snow uphill both ways, but they really become proud and they become ambassadors. And then the other uh, two more benefits, one of the other benefits is the new employees now know cool people on the team. So when they start work in that department next week, they know people with seniority, with collateral. And then finally, one of my favorite benefits is I always know when an existing employee goes through reorientation because there's a bounce in their step or I'll get a text saying, John, I just went through the orientation. I got to tell you, I forgot how great this company is and all that. So love that. Highly recommend it. Another part of orientation that some companies do is a scavenger hunt. They turn a portion of their their orientation into going to the, the, the locations or departments and trivia question. The one drawback with orientation that you got to have is going over company policies, right? And what is company policy? Is it's it, it's code for how not to get fired, right? So if I'm sitting there and, and saying, listen, if you're late three times or you get suspended, fired, if you're this, and you know, you get if you're chewing gum. So so they've turned or we've turned that part of that with other trivia. And 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 instead of sitting in a room and hearing this boring thing, you go find out why. Right. And and so, you know, the employees break up into teams and they go to different locations or different departments and they come in with this sheet of 20, 25 questions and existing employees, when they see them walk in, they could totally tell that they're new employees and existing employees go and they, they say, let me help. What do you got? Because they know the answers and we love to know answers. So if I see someone with something I know, I'm going to come over and, and feel really smart. And they'll look at the first, oh, that, that's that's that person over there. Go to, you know, they have to take a picture with the person. So, and they hear, hear stories. They hear why this is a policy. So scavenger hunt is so great. Another great best practice to do when someone's starting is, you know, whenever someone gets a new job for the next, you know, three to six months, everywhere they go, holidays, out with their friends, you name it, several people are going to ask them about their job. Hey, I heard you got a new job or where are you working? And, and so you want to give them a good sound bite that's more articulate than, than they, may, they may say, right? Instead of, oh, I'm just answering phones, booking appointments, you know, w- working in a call center, whatever it may be, you know, hey, I, I, I work in the relationship center where I help provide experiences for a company who's one of the top 20 in their industry. And it ends up being something that they're very proud of. And it's a commercial and advertisement for your brand. People actually ask if there's if that if, if we're hiring when they hear the way people describe that. So another really great best practice is having touch bases. There's nothing worse in your first 90 days you know, you're the freshman trying to find, uh, you know, being overwhelmed, not knowing anything, not knowing terminology, not knowing where things are. So having a mentor and, and someone touching base on every 15, 30, 60, and 90 days. Some other great onboarding. Look at, at your training of new employees and how much training you'll put them through and compare what percentage hours are are put for the technical training operational versus soft skill training and 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 the certification of that and too often most companies are in the high 90s of 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 this time spent uh operational technical and barely any soft skill training so it doesn't have to be 50 50 but there needs to be a good representation and what some soft skill training looks like is what your you know customer experience action statement is showing them a day in the life of a customer having your nevers and always non-negotiable. What is your customer experience cycle and what do you have to do and avoid at every stage with the clients? Service defects, non-negotiable standards above and beyond. And what's your service recovery protocol when something goes wrong that they can handle, that they can own that experience? And then the last thing is, is what we like to call as an employee service aptitude test. So that's a really easy, short, 20, two dozen questions. They're not hard. And so a lot of times when it's a scenario, all right, if, if a customer walks in or you're dealing with a customer and this, 
and, and, and the employee, a lot of times will know reading the answers, which one's the best, right? C is obviously the best answer. Okay. So, but here's the trick. They wouldn't have ever thought to do C until they read that. So it, it really helps. It's, it's a learning, a test that you actually learn on, but if they didn't pick C, doesn't mean they don't get hired, but it, it's an opportunity to coach them. So, so, so why didn't you pick C? Why'd you pick B? And they're like, well, because at the last job I worked at, I would have gotten fired for doing C. Well, here we want you to do C. We want you to be naive, not paranoid. So creating a short employee service aptitude test is, is a fantastic tool. Hi, this is Denise Thompson, managing partner of the DeJulius Group. We know it can be difficult getting the whole team as excited as you are about customer experience. You talk to them, write newsletters, and it seems to go in one ear and out the other. Sometimes it's the message. Sometimes it's the messenger. Sometimes it's just a tough crowd. Consider bringing John in to speak live at your next company or association event. He'll have them laughing, crying, cheering, and most importantly, understanding how to become world-class. Visit johndejulius.com for details or to book your date now. All right, we talked about the recruitment experience. We talked about the onboarding experience. Let's talk about the employee experience, meaning going on now you're past your 90 days. We want to build a, a, a moat around your top talent. Do you know your turnover rates? A lot of leaders do, but you got to then break your turnover rates down by where an employee life cycle it happens in the first 90 days, four months to one year, two to five years, six to 10, 11 and up. They'll be startling if you've never done this to find out where it falls. And, and, you know, we've had it. And, and, you know, while we've been lucky to have low turnover in our business, there are spots of our turnover where it fell in two spots. And so what we were able to do is say, why? Why are we losing people at this point? And we were able to reduce some of the service defects we were doing with our employees. One was in our 90 days. We were losing employees in our 90 days because it was a fire hose. Our training was overwhelming you know, a lot of things. So we were able to slow that down, crawl, walk, and run. They didn't have to learn everything in the first 90 days, give them a mentor, touch bases with them, give them little victories, make them feel good, crawl, walk, and run. So it's a really good opportunity to to examine where your turnover is and why. Another good place is to find out and by department, because, you know, turnover usually it correlates with the leader. So that's really important. Train the whole person. OK, and this is really important. Employees, employers are, are employees are so used to, you know, feeling like they're just a, a pawn and, and whoever could be more productive and most efficient. So we like to also beyond professional development, help them with personal development and professional development. We like to help focus and bring resources, provide resources to our employees on the five F's. The five F's are typically the most popular new year's resolutions. Okay. So they have to do with finances, fitness, family, faith, and fun. Okay. And so, you know, we will, you know, when we're having team meetings or we'll just offer it, it could be a Zoom call, a Zoom webinar. We will bring in, you know, let's say a mortgage lender for anyone that is considering buying a new home or their first home. And, and the mortgage lender will come on, you know, someone who's, who's a weight loss or fitness or, or, or parenting, whatever it may be, we help bring in resources. We don't have to pay them. Because these experts have an opportunity of picking up, you know, clients, customers, but the employees really appreciate that they can have their spouses on to really help them. It might be just something like, you know, for, for fitness, helping them with the best apps for meditation or yoga or negotiating a deal with a local fitness center or yoga or, or whatever that if you're an employee of ours, you get, you know, 10% off, but just constantly trying to make the employee train the whole person. One of my favorite things is helping our employees with Ikigai. Okay. Ikigai is uh, the Japanese word for finding your calling in life. And, uh, you know, we talked to our employees about this. And Ikigai, four things have to intersect to finding your purpose in life. First one is, is something you love to do. 
Okay, but that's by itself isn't enough. The second thing that's near sect is this something that you could be great at, something that you could be in the top three percent. Something you love to do that you can't be great at is a hobby, right? Something that you could be great at that you don't love to do is a job, right? So we want both of those. The third one is something that you can make a really good living at. And then the fourth one is it adds a positive impact to the world. So so we help employees. You know, as you're growing, hopefully that means there's there's opportunities where I mean, we've had people work for us, you know, 20, 25 years that have been in different companies for us that have had, you know, eight to 10 different positions. Right. They, they maxed out. It wasn't something uh, they wanted to do anymore. Fortunately, there was something else. But we've also had employees that we weren't their ikigai. This wasn't something they wanted. They saw themselves doing in, in five years. So let's help them get there. When you do that, that really sends a message. And while they're there for two, three years, they give you a lot more than they would have and they appreciate it. And it also just sends a, a great viral message to the rest of your staff. I love this quote by Charlie Kim, founder of Next Jump. If you had hard times in your family, would you ever consider laying off one of your children? I would, but that's not the point. Next Jump offers lifetime employment. Okay, and, and what they call is no brilliant jerks allowed. And what they mean by this is if you have a bad attitude, you can get out. But if you struggle with performance, if you struggle with the job, they will re-educate you or they will recast you. But you can't lose your job on performance. OK, and as a result, annual sales, since they've rolled this out, have increased five times, over $2.5 billion since launching Lifetime Employment Policy in 2012. I want to share our leadership mission that we have for our employees, and we try to advertise this to our employees in the interview process, in orientation, and ongoing. The reason why we advertise this is because we want the pressure. We want to be held accountable by our employees. So this is our, our, our leadership mission to our employees. We want you to make paychecks more than you ever thought possible. However, we want you to feel that the money you made was the least valuable thing you received from this company, right? We want you to make paychecks more than you ever thought possible. However, we want you to feel the money you made was the least valuable thing you've received from this company. A great leadership test, like so when we're doing a workshop with uh, leaders on, on world-class and uh, the employee experience revolution, we will give every leader in that room a document with their direct reports. Obviously, we, we, we get this uh, done ahead of time. And so maybe you have 10 direct reports, maybe you have 15. And then they have to do a Ford test on their employees, okay? So the the Ford, if, if, if you're not aware, stands for Family Occupation, Recreation, and Dreams. And it's like, how well do you know the employees you work with and that, that report to you? And sometimes it's embarrassing that, you know, I know she has two kids, I don't know their names. I can't even tell you if they're two boys, two girls, a boy and a girl, right? So so we, if we expect our employees to deliver world-class customer experience, we better know their Ford. And O, right? Well, they work for us. So you know that doesn't count. The O, what we do there is, what is their five-year goal? What do they want to be doing in five years? That's the O. And so this is a great, great exercise to wake up. To wake up you yourself and your leaders to realize there's there, you know I need to be knowing my employees celebrating with them the things that they you know they, that they do in their life family occupation recreation and dreams another new skill set that was never needed before is leading from a distance this is really really important it is hard it's never been taught before in any management class any any course anything now so you know the the, the keys to this uh, if you have a hybrid or work from home workforce is making sure and we should be doing this anyway but we got to do it even uh, more now is making sure we tie employees role directly to the overall sense of purpose, building relationships through uh, making an emotional connection. It's not as easy when I'm not seeing you in, in the hallway collisions, or we call it Keurig conversations. We got, and, and it's not as easy when you're doing a Zoom meeting and we got, you know, from 12 to one and we got this tight agenda and, and there's no room for innocuous conversations to come, come up. So we got to have uh, regular unstructured one-on-one check-ins 
finding out how employees are really doing. No, really, how are you doing? Show emotional connection. As a leader, you got to humanize yourself through and show, showing vulnerability with an employee saying, yeah, it's been hard for me too, or I've struggled with that, or I have someone in my family that struggles with that. Replicate those curated conversations where you know you'd go down rabbit holes. And I say all the time that relationships are built in rabbit holes, right? Where you go down a rabbit hole and you find something out professionally or personally. And again, our, our hybrid or our virtual world doesn't allow for rabbit holes. So you have to create them. Again, find out how they're really doing. I have two really important leadership philosophies I try to make sure are advertised to my employees. And the first one is, I will be disappointed if you're going through hard times and did not let us know and give, give us the opportunity to see if we can uh, help you in some way. And the second one is, I will be disappointed if you ever miss an important family event. No employee should be missing family events. Work can be designed around that. So um, those two things. The last thing I want to share with you is I love this word encourage and the Latin meaning for encourage is to make strong. Okay. So when you think about that, to make strong, encourage, right? In courage, encourage, courage, to put courage in someone, right? To make them strong. So as leaders, as parents, as human beings, I think we need to, you know, constantly be, be critical putting courage in other people, right? So so they feel, I mean, what a great honor it is to have the responsibility to be the fundamental reason why people accomplish more, enjoy more, and are more fulfilled in the one life they have to live because they worked for you. So let's revisit the employee experience revolution. Great brands are born to help people live extraordinary lives. Great leaders inspire their employees to build lives of meaning and purpose. Excuse me. As a result, they help their employees and customers reach their fullest potential. Thanks for listening in to this episode of the Customer Service Revolution podcast. I'm Denise Thompson, managing partner of the DeJulius Group, and I invite you to send us your questions, post a review, and let us know what you liked and want to hear more of. We're happy that you're part of the customer service revolution and encourage you to subscribe now so you don't miss an episode. You'll find us on Spotify, iTunes, or your favorite podcast station. 